lecturer in the department, but she's not new to Imperial College. She's been uh, with Imperial for a few years now. She has been with the Data Science Institute uh, since 2017. And at the Data Science Institute, she created and actually is leading, still leading, uh, and coordinating a group um, for data simulation and machine learning called Data Learning. There's a series of seminars that Data Learning organizes. Um, if you're not part of that list and you're interested in those seminars, contact Rosella. Um, there's some really interesting stuff being presented there, so I highly recommend that. Um, Rosella also collaborates, um, so she's part of the Data Science Institute, or West part of the Data Science Institute for a while. She also collaborates with the Business School, the Leonardo Center at Imperial Business School, and that gives you already a sense of the personality of Rosella. She really is across multiple discipline applying mathematics and um, data science machine learning to a number of different disciplines from business to um, to computer science to earth science um, then um, her work actually has wide-ranging application like i said from finance social science to climate she's developed multiple code for uh, parallel techniques for accurate and efficient data assimilation and machine learning models I assume we'll hear more about the data simulation and machine learning models today, although it's going to be the application from what I understand, but very much looking forward to this. Um, now for the for the details, uh, Rosella has a PhD in computational and computer science uh, in 2012. She's a member of the artificial intelligence or AI network at Imperial. And she received acknowledgement of the Marie Curie Skodok <laughs> Marie Skodowska Curie Fellowship from the European Commission um, uh, in 2017. And she's very much involved as a collaborator and leader on multiple grants in the department. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's really a pleasure to have you here in the department. And it's a pleasure to welcome you for this seminar. So the floor is yours, Rosella. Thank you very much, Cedric. Uh, very nice. Um, and uh, let me share my screen, first of all, so I can... Um... ...start presenting. Can you see my screen? Can you please yeah, confirm we, that? We can see your screen and it's in full screen. Brilliant. Thank you very much again. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you everybody for attending to this talk today. So um, as Cedric um, said in my introduction, I'm a new lecturer in the Department of Science and Engineering and uh, I'm still leading the uh, Data Learning Group in the Data Science Institute. When, uh, where I started uh, this, let's say, integration of data simulation approaches and um, with machine learning, and I call that data learning. I will tell you why. And um, <clears throat> this, just to be sure that um, you already know that this uh, talk will be no too technical. So um, my background is in math and computer science, but I will not show you equations, uh, details about the models. Uh, this talk will be more an overview about what these technologies, what this data learning can do for real world applications and how it can be applied. So um, the main point is that um, obviously we are in the era of the data, we know that. And uh, before it was uh, quite difficult learning something from the data, but now we have uh, we are in the era of the big data. The data available are starting to be huge and sometimes also unmanageable. So, uh, but just to let you see what I mean when I say data, what I mean is data from a lot of different sources. They can be social media, satellite, sensors, forecasting model, for example, the one that uh, some people in, uh, in this department are developing. Uh, for example, um, one of the main providers of data for me and my group is at the group of Professor Payne. And also data from, for example, Reddit or other kind of simulation, weather forecasting. So any kind of information that you can capture for, from broad 
uh, real observation and uh, simulation. So this is what I mean with data. The point is, OK, lots of data, lots of interaction, people sharing data from a lot of different institutions, companies involved, and uh, all these networks uh, of people sharing data about what can you do with this data? How can data learning uh, be applied to this data? So the main reason, so the main application, the main motivation behind data learning, and I will show you what data learning is, but let me tell you first, the motivation is something called digital twins. So we are in the era of the data, and now we are able to build something um, that is completely digital and is a twin of a real case scenario. But what is a digital twin? When I ask what is a digital twin, people have a lot of different definitions. So let me tell you what is a digital twin from a data science perspective. To build a digital twin, you need to implement from the data you have data-driven models, sometimes something called surrogate models. I will tell you more about this. What is that? Physics informed machine learning models. And when you build this model, you have to be careful about all the uncertainty in this data. So a data scientist usually has to work a lot on uncertainty quantification and minimization. And one of the key points is something called explainable AI. Because when you develop a model, a digital twin, a model of something uh, completely data driven, uh, people have the impression that they don't have under control what the model is doing. They feel like uh, they have a black box in front of them. So a real key topic for us is always try to open this black box and be sure that the models we are developing and providing to other people to be used are explainable in this sense. So that beautiful, lots of data. Let's play with the data. What can we do with this data for a real world application? First of all, we want to learn the dynamic behind the data. Sometimes you don't know what is the physics behind a set of data and you want to learn the dynamic to see if there is a dynamic, for example. Sometimes the data are so big that you cannot really manage them, so you need to compress the data. So we work on uh, data compression methods. And also, all the time, we want to be sure that the models we are developing are stable and reliable so there are some particular, um, let's say, type of models that we implement to be sure that our models are stable and reliable. So data-driven approach is beautiful, but when you try to build these data-driven models, as I said, you have lots of problems related to dimensionality constraints. As I said, you have to compress the data sometimes. You cannot solve your, um, you cannot manage the data on a laptop, for example, you need supercomputers. Then you have to manage the problem of noisy data. All data are noisy. So all data is noisy. So it's not like um, you, you, you cannot delete the noise. You just need to understand how to manage the noise, the information you have about the error in the data, and then include this in the model. And sometimes you have low quality data. When I say low quality data, I mean like, for example, you want to model something, airflow, and you have temperature and you don't have pressure, uh, but you want to understand what is the pressure from the temperature. So you have values of some variables, but they are not completely um, meaningful for the application. In that case, we call that low quality data. So all these problems can uh, be partially solved integrating data driven models, mainly based on machine learning um, with artificial intelligence with data assimilation. So data assimilation need in uncertainty quantification and minimization technique. This is the reason why well, when we develop our models, most of the time we couple data simulation approaches, so data science approaches with machine learning approaches. We couple that together in something called data learning. So data learning models are 
the, the models we are developing are very general and uh, um, in the group we um, are created a few years ago, we work on a lot of different applications and I will show you uh, some of them, starting from social science, medical application, finance, geoscience, um, especially engineering, etc. And uh, um, in this application, our network of collaborations within some grants obviously have been very helpful. Um, in the group, there are a few collaborators working uh, with me uh, to develop these technologies. And especially, there are lots of students. Unfortunately, I couldn't have all the students in this slide. So these are just few of the students, especially the first one that started join, joining us and the one that have produced a good um, um, impact. So the one that have published paper on good journal and etc. So these are all master students that every year come to our group to work with us for their individual projects and they are very welcome. And talking about students and papers all together, um, just before last Christmas, so 2021, um, we finally published our first paper, some of us together. The title is obviously Data Learning, Integrating Data Simulation and Machine Learning. And uh, in this paper, uh, we put together some of our approaches and um, the reason why we can really apply these methodologies to a lot different applications is mainly because the methodologies have a modular approach. What I mean is like you, we obviously we combine them from the math side, so we don't use them as black boxes, but we combine them in a modular way so that same technologies can be slightly modified to um, solve to be applied for a different application. And in the paper, you will find some of them, for example, combining data simulation, PCA, neural network, autoencoders, uh, steel Gaussian processes, convolutional neural networks, and so on. But the main point when you have all this availability of technologies is that, okay, now, I want to uh, solve this uh, real world application. I need to do some stuff, but how can I decide what is the technology that I need? This is the main question, no? If you come from another field and you say, okay, I want to apply something to, in my case, in my application, but what, what should I apply? This is one of the main questions that people ask me when they um, have to have collaborations. So essentially, I think we can separate the uh, methodologies uh, depending on the what you need. So for example, if you need higher accuracy, this means that you want something really good in terms of accuracy, you implement some technologies. If you really care to have, for example, real time forecasting, then efficiency, then you apply other kind of application. And also there is a difference uh, if you want to, if you can, use your application offline in research and development. For example, if you talk with companies, they call that research and development, or if you want to use that online, for example, in the production in runtime. And so the main applications are um, optimal data selection, parameter estimation, all, all of these are used then coupled with the predictions, data simulation, surrogate models, uh, data-driven models, data learning. And I will show you some of these uh, applications, uh, uh, some of these models apply to a lot of different scenarios. So as I said, I will be quite fast going on, um, on the application. I will go not too deep in the details, but um, all the um, models I'm showing you and all the application I'm showing you have been published. Most of them, just a couple, probably not yet, just submitted. But most of them are already online. So in case of any further question, happy to share with you all the details and go deep in how these technologies work. So 
Um, obviously, before applying any kind of data-driven model, we always work on a pre-process. So we study the error in the data, the distribution of the error, the covenances of the error, and we always focus on the question from the real world scenario. So what is the question that this data-driven model is trying to answer for decision making? So let's start with first optimal data selection and parameter estimation. So optimal data selection, when an optimal data selection may be interesting. For example, uh, in a context of uh, um, sensor placement. Imagine you have um, a room and you want to place some sensors to understand how the, um, to capture something within the room that may be, for example, the temperature or the air quality or other information. But it can be a room for any other kind of domain. So you want to put some sensors. And the question here is, OK, where should I put the sensor to have the best um, information within that scenario? Because sometimes people feel like putting a sensor in a random place is the same that deciding uh, an optimal placement, but it has been proved quite a lot that it's not it's not the case, especially um, uh, when you want to, when you try to understand uh, um, something from a um, dynamic something for a dynamic system. For example, in a room, you open the window and you have fresh air coming in, and then you want to understand how these, um, for example, the air quality of the air is changing or the temperature is changing, then you really need to put the sensor in an optimal place. And you can see here how a technology based on data simulation and Gaussian process can really um, strongly reduce the error within the simulation when you learn information from a sensor randomly or when you have a proper placement of the sensor. So the error is reducing to up for um, three orders of magnitude. As you said, these are completely general. Uh, the same technologies can be applied indoor, but also for high outdoor environments. And this is another example. For example, this is the London Sun, um, this is Elephant and Castle and um, South London, in South London. And this is the uh, 3D domain of, that has been used for the um, a computational fluidodynamic software developed in, uh, in two projects, MAGIC and uh, HENAIL. And then you can see how placing, even in, in the streets, if you place the random, uh, randomly, uh, if you place the sensors randomly or if you place the sensors in an optimal position, then these really affect the, um, the accuracy of the results when you try to capture information from the sensors. Completely different application, cryptocurrency market. So when I started working on uh, on this model, it was like um, like three years ago with uh, Philip, um, one of the PhD students uh, I supervised in the Data Science Institute. And the question here was slightly different. We didn't try to find something optimal to, to place or, you know, it was something completely different. The question here is, OK, I have this economic model. I have few parameters that potentially should um, change in time, so dynamically. So even the parameters are describing a dynamic system. How can I learn these parameters from the data? And how can I then estimate this parameter using something like, for example, data simulation? Uh, so looking at the data, obviously, this is, for example, the interaction selling, receiving of um, different kind of cryptocurrencies. And then if you open one of these points, then you have time series. And we did it. Uh, as I said, I will not give you too many details about how, but uh, we have published quite a lot uh, of a few papers about uh, about these, um, these applications, let's say. And what we can see is that learning the parameters in a dynamical way from the data in runtime can really improve the forecasting, the short range forecasting in this case um, of up to six orders of magnitude of just putting uh, the uh, static uh, values of, um, of parameters or 
adjust parameters that have been set up from historical data. Then, estimating the parameters in 2000, end of 2019, um, uh, with Philip, we were still working on uh, the cryptocurrency market, but then COVID started. We all are in this new era now, new world after COVID. Hopefully, uh, soon after COVID, we can say that. Um, in uh, so end of 2019, we said, okay, um, with the director of the Data Science Institute, Professor Guo, he said, okay, guys, what can you do to help with uh, models? With modeling the pandemic, can can you use the same technologies? And as I said at the beginning, these technologies are modular, are really um, easy to to be readapted to different scenarios. So we said, okay, let's do that. And we started working on the same technologies, but for modeling the pandemic. And this is a photo of uh, our first meeting uh, as data learning group at the Royal Society um, when we were showing our first results and also Ferguson was showing his first results and uh, uh, we were all very sad looking at the projections, but we tried at least to have uh, projections. We have done for that essentially is the same estimating parameters but of an epi epidemiologic model instead of an economic model and also we have um, in another paper introduced like um, uh, in the epidemiologic model um, a slightly modification when it can be applied in some scenarios so essentially what we have done we assume that we have this epidemiologic model and then we started learning uh, from the um, information that day by day uh, governments were producing in terms of infections and data provided by the hospitals, etc. So we, we started learning this information to improve the uh, projection of the number of future infections, the, the projection of the peak, etc. And, um, and so, and at some point we started uh, implementing also different approaches which are which was um, approaches based on a coupling of uh, data driven machine learning models with physics models and this was uh, uh, we have found that this was very helpful even more helpful like learning completely from the data assuming that the SEER model was slightly correct with some uh, errors obviously in it and trying to combine them and why we were trying to do that is because if you remember, especially at the beginning, we were no um, government didn't really know what to implement in terms of mitigation effects. So the two meters rule or suppression effect, such as, for example, a lockdown. And uh, in this kind of model, you can put in the mitigation effect, the suppression effect and understand the um, how the projections can go and these are a few applications for example in uh, Wuhan and uh, United Kingdom now we were talking about something that you really um, when you really care about the accuracy but let's see when you care about accuracy of course but you want something really fast uh, surrogate models fast machine learning models that are able to emulate computational fluidodynamic dynamic simulations. So these technologies, there are quite few now uh, that has, um, have been developed in, um, in the data learning group. So these technologies are a combination of machine learning, data simulation, uh, um, data compression, and uh, what we really care about, and as I said at the beginning, is that our model um, must be stable. And so we work quite a lot on uh, something called generative adversarial network approaches that are helping, helping to have uh, to make our model stable, more stable for future forecasting. And just to underline that um, uh, one something that is really making a difference between our group and other groups 
worldwide. We, there are also there are other groups, and uh, uh, during our uh, data learning meeting, uh, we have uh, we had a lot of invited speakers from institutions worldwide talking about how they develop their surrogate models. Um, the main difference is that we work with unstructured meshes. Because when I, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we are not the one developing the computational pseudodynamic simulations. Um, most of them are coming from another group, actually in this department, the science and engineering department, from the group of Professor Payne. And uh, so we use just the results of the computational pseudodynamic simulation. So the, the measures are structured and we cannot apply the standard machine learning approaches because we have to face this problem of um, unstructured meshes. Happy to do that because it's challenging for us and we like uh, the in this situation of developing challenging models. Other applications, for example, flow path transition in two phase flow in pipes. Um, uh, this is the photo of Sibo, another of um, the post, another postdoc working in the in the data uh, learning group. And uh, this is, for example, what the CFT is simulating, what the prediction is simulating. The difference is that uh, the uh, CFD is taking around 40 hours to run. Uh, the latent prediction takes a few seconds. And the, uh, if you if you look at the um, difference in terms of um, accuracy, the um, latent predictions is working quite well. Another application, coalescence, for example, and um, same same technology, similar technologies, but the data in this case are coming from images because they are coming from experiments. And also, uh, in this way, we can build from scratch, let's say, how the uh, dynamic of the, the model, how the dynamic of this coalescence happens. Data simulation. So data simulation is, is um, something that when you have your forecasting model and then you have new data that you want to ingest in your forecasting model, why you want to ingest new data, to improve the accuracy of your forecasting model. And this is how data simulation works. So you have your forecasting model. For example, this is the simulation of, it may be something, uh, for, for example, like the acceleration of a car, uh, the uh, air pollution produced by a car accelerating. And then you have, for example, that the sensors are saying something different. So you, you want to couple these two informations, and this is what the assimilation of the two informations show you. And uh, this can be done with standard approaches or with machine learning approaches. But anyway, the um, still in the, the point here is improving the accuracy of your forecasting, ingesting new information in runtime. What, what can you assimilate? Okay, for example, data from sensors, but can you assimilate something, for example, an image? Still COVID scenario. We started working with the RAM task uh, uh, led by Professor Linden and Professor Payne for the uh, air flow and air quality. And as data scientists, what can we do for that? So they have produced this beautiful simulation of people coughing and sneezing because they wanted to understand what you know, what happened when people cough or sneeze. And as data scientists, we, we said, OK, so let's try all also this time to improve the accuracy. What, what can we assimilate in the simulation of people coughing and sneezing? We can assimilate, for example, the images of people coughing and sneezing to adjust the CFD in a way that the CFD is more accurate. And this is what happens, for example, you can see in this gift um, for different time steps, how this integration of the observation and the background is happening. So how data simulation is merging these two informations. And the reason why, obviously, you want to do that because it has been proved that, thanks to the backward error analysis, that if you improve the initial condition of any kind of simulation, if you improve the and make it more realistic 
then also the solution after a few time steps, even when you don't have observations anymore, will be more realistic and reliable. And this is the reason why we also work on this kind of application, assimilating um, images of people sneezing and coughing in CFD simulation. So what I was showing you um, over the past slides was something big, but not too big. But OK, what happened when I have something really big? I'm showing this is our campus. For example, we are like uh, you can see the Albert Hall. So this is not just our campus, also the, um, the neighbor. And um, but if we want to apply something like that, like assimilating data from sensors in a domain like this, when we have almost 30 million of nodes and the complexity of these models is quite high, how can we do that? It's the same problem that people working weather forecasting have and climate change, uh, ocean. So it's same problems, no? Because the, the, the grid here is really fine. So the number of nodes is huge. And uh, in these scenarios, we implement domain decomposition also for our data simulation approaches and for our machine learning. And something nice that I want to show you, because we are going towards the zero pollution and being trying to be greener, <laughs> the, what the, the, the impact of these uh, kind of models, of course, we reduce the execution time. Of course, we are able to manage subdomains instead of a big domain, so we can manage the problem but another nice impact is the consumption in uh, the consumption in terms of um, joules so the energy that your machine will consume if instead of running a standard algorithm you implement what we have been implementing here based on data simulation uh, based on domain decomposition so you have an impact also in terms of um, energy consumption and this makes us very happy um, assimilation of other application in other kind of applications. Let's see the Brexit. So these are data from the Brexit. People um, talking about Brexit, and about the Brexit, we have data from Twitter and pooling data. And let's see if merging together, we can really understand what is going on. And obviously, this uh, um, model. Have, so we, ha we have been working on these models and using the Brexit as a test case too late. But um, as you can see, there is something in terms of support going down and something in terms of support going up. And unfortunately, going down was the remain and going up was is. In fact, the Brexit happened. Other applications just started this year with another student. As I said, we do quite a lot with our master's students. Happy to, to do that. And uh, with another master's student this year, we have been applying the same technology in the context of an energy control system. And uh, we can see that in integrating data simulation in an energy control system can really um, reduce can reduce the number of uh, uh, time when the um, agent makes mistake, let's say. And um, we just started. We also have like a nice paper on that, but uh, happy to continue on this topic. I think it's quite um, an exciting topic. Finally, uh, data learning and surrogate models. So another question that may be interesting for some is what happens when I have data in a time window, for example, data from sensors, data from satellites, data in a time window, and then after I don't have data anymore, what can I do? Can I learn something from the data I have previously and use this information in the future? To answer this question, we developed with Cesar, another of the postdocs of the data learning group, something called reduce order deep data simulation technology, RODA. What RODA does, 
essentially learn the misfit between a CSD and the results of the data simulation. Not the misfit between the CFD and the observations, but the misfit between the CFD and the results of the data simulation, because we are assuming all the time that our observations are not the ground truth. Data coming from sensors, data coming from satellites, they come with a big error. So we cannot assume them to be um, ground truth. But data simulation, which is a combination of the CFD and the uh, observation um, in a, let's say, in an optimal way, is for us something that we can consider better as a ground truth. Obviously, if you do a stable and reliable data simulation. And so we then tried to apply these in one of the test cases. And what you can see in the plot is that um, RODA, so this UDDA, doesn't know the observations in the future, but is still able to improve the results of the CFD because RODA knows in general what must be the misfit between the CFD and the data simulation. So it's emulating a data simulation approach. And another advantage, another good point, let's say, of this is that um, the execution time. So data simulation sometimes can be quite slow. RODA, as is mainly basically a neural network, is uh, very fast and is uh, one times fast, uh, one thousand times faster than a standard data simulation in this test case. Then other complex scenarios, for example, wildfire, so simulations and satellite data, putting them together with compression data simulation, um, other complex system that complex systems that we want to um, simulate completely data driven. And um, Another one main point in uh, our research over the past year has been, OK, now we have this data from satellites. We have this data from the simulations. We have great also data from social media. But can we really use data from social media for a system like a wildfire system or any other, you know, natural event? So we have been thinking about that. And actually, uh, the point is that if you check the number of images and information that people are posting all the time online is huge. So the question for us was, OK, how can we use this information? Can we try to use this information in real time? Because when you have a wildfire and you want to understand something from a satellite, it's not really a real time. Is there something faster than a satellite that can say to us, OK, something is happening in that place? And then you can check after with the satellite and make, you know. And implement a decision making. So this is what we're doing, for example, with the Lever Home Center or wildfires imperial together with Jake and Sibo. So Jake is working on this part of uh, making forecasting, wildfire forecasting using data from Twitter. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of work behind in terms of analysis uh, together with T Twitter. You can also use other uh, social media, for example, Reddit, and you can integrate Twitter, Twitter and Reddit using data simulation, as I said, in other application, modular approaches, we can do that. And Jake is working on, uh, Jake is a um, uh, PhD student of the Earth Science and Engineering Department. Um, he's um, part of the data learning group, obviously, he's working on exactly using information from Twitter, the sentiment of people and an analysis of the sentiment of people to understand if a wildfire is, a wildfire is happening and where. So, so far with the test cases that he has used in uh, both the US 
and Australia. It has been quite um, uh, successful. We still um, improving the system, obviously, but um, the proof of concept, we have the proof of concept now. So working on these um, sentiment of people to couple that with the geoscience application. But let's go back to the digital twins because we started from the digital twins. OK, so we are developing these digital twins using data learning. And uh, so all these data driven models with data simulation in it, the compression of the data, brilliant. But we want to be sure that when we implement something, uh, we don't want that what we the data driven model is completely customized on what we are uh, implementing and what we are modeling. So we want something general. And for this, uh, we have been working over the past year on something called physics in for machine learning for dynamical systems. So with machine learning, as I've been showing, uh, usually you have higher accuracy because you go faster than with data simulation, uh, higher efficiency because you go faster than with data simulation, you have higher accuracy, so you improve the forecasting, but Want efficiency and accuracy. This is what you what you should achieve at some point. And so we have been thinking about how can we achieve it. So most of the data driven models that we are developing them are based on uh, something called neural networks, which is essentially an artificial version of what a biological network is. So you have this input and then the output, and then you have the neuron. And in the neural network field, what is really important is setting up these weights, these weights that you have on this um, connection between the input and the neuron. So these weights are the one that are giving you a good prediction or a bad prediction, because it's giving you a good network data-driven model in a bad one. So we were thinking, OK, so we should focus on this point, making these weights as much accurate as possible. So we started um, from a standard machine learning, and this is what I've been showing you over the past slides. But what if we put somehow the um, the CFD, the dynamic system, in the process of learning these weights. So this is what we have been doing in a real case scenario. So modifying something called loss function. I will give you not too many details because it's. Um, I, I will share that with you in case you are interested. So writing a customized, a proper loss function. But we have that a standard data driven is obviously able to um, give prediction um, of what the CFT is predicting, so emulating the CFT. The physics informed data driven is doing the same. OK, but what's the benefit, the real benefit of this? Why you build all this new uh, model and then you don't have, let's say, a huge improvement? So oh, the real improvement is, oh sorry, the real improvement uh, is no working. The real improvement is for the um, generability. So the data driven that I've been showing you was trained on. Uh, this is the simulation of airflow around one building, and then we have tried to use that with three buildings. So as you can see, a uh, standard data driven explodes after one time step because the data driven doesn't recognize the scenario. The physics informed data driven, no. The physics informed data driven, the weights are able, so the network is able to understand that there is something change, something different, but it learns the dynamic of the model, not just the dynamic for that building, but the world dynamic of the model, and so is able to uh, simulate what is happening with three buildings. And you can see um, on the bottom some results in terms of accuracy. 
Obviously, the difference, the huge difference is that when you want to train a physics informed data uh, driven, you, you need a lot of more time in terms of um, training. But then you, you do that once and you have it quite general for future forecasting. So just to close, to wrap up the talk, um, we are very happy to share uh, what we are doing. So our codes are on our GitHub. So if you go on the GitHub, the LVG, which means data learning working group, you will find uh, all the codes that we are developing. And also, um, in case you want um, any further information, if you are happy to have uh, in uh, collaborations with us, please just send me or an email or to one of my collaborators an email. We are really happy to uh, collaborate with other with other groups. And uh, we are meeting, as Cedric has said at the beginning, uh, we are meeting every Tuesday at 4 p.m. UK time. And um, if you are interested in checking uh, what is going on uh, every Tuesday, we have a YouTube channel so you can see um, previous talks from previous uh, invited speakers. And also um, every year we organize a workshop as part of the International Conference on Computational Science which is a, a top conference for computational science. We have a thematic track called uh, Machine Learning and Data Simulation for Dynamical Systems. Um, so we have a good network of people coming every year now uh, presenting their contribution and you are very welcome to uh, join us. The conference will be, the workshop will be in June, uh, but the um, submission, the deadline for the submission of abstract or papers is quite soon, uh, beginning of February. Please send me an email uh, in case you are interested. And uh, with this, I just want to say you, thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wow, well, thank you very much, uh, Rosella. That was a very impressive talk. Really, really, really good. Um, right, so we have time for questions. Uh, feel free to raise your hand or you can also put your question in the chat. Uh, may I suggest that you ask your question, maybe introduce yourself, that way Rosella may not know everybody. So that's a chance also for her to, uh, to meet and put a name on her face. So who wants to go first? Well, if no one wants to go first, I have a, I have a couple of questions for you, Rosella, and then I'll give time for people to come up with their own questions. Um, the first one is you talk about assimilating the data with the CFD. And I'm not sure I fully understand. You say you don't trust that the data is accurate. So you look at the difference between the CFD and the, and the data point and you, you think the data can can be inaccurate. But do you assume that the CFD is the truth or do you assume that there's also an error on the CFD? Right, you assume there's also an error of the CFD. So how do you how do you partition the error? What's the what's the approach behind that? Yeah, there are um, quite a few points about that. So data simulation is a, an optimization, let's say, problem. And uh, so you before building the optimization function, you um, estimate the distribution of the errors, the covariances of the errors. And then you use this information in the optimization problem. So the covariances of the distribution of an error usually give us how much the error in, the, in that data set is spreading. So just to give you an example, uh, Imagine in um, in our room, my room and you in your room, you have two kinds of information, one from a thermometer and another from the uh, heat equation. You know? And then you know that, for example, the heat equation may have an error of, I don't know, 0 0.01 on the second, mm, 0 0.01, like in terms of uh, um, covariance. Or and the, the thermometer also has an error in that. So when you combine together these two information, you consider the inverse of these errors. 
which means when you have a big error, that data has a less importance in the optimization problem. When you have a small error, that data with the inverse, that data has a big weight in the optimization. And this is the way we do that. But how do you know what the error on your CFD is? Because it's a mathematical model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, the way we do that, usually we use output from the CFD, so uh, time series, uh, and yeah. then we learn the um, variability of, okay. uh, of the data in the time series, and we use that information as estimation of the error. Okay, great. Thanks. That's very clear. I see that Sanjay has a question. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, my name is Sanjay Prasad. I'm a cardiologist at Imperial in the Brompton. So my question is that we see patients that are regularly at risk of decompensating or at risk of sudden cardiac death. And, and our big challenge is how to anticipate that. The problem is that we have hugely heterogeneous information on these patients. Their clinical profile is highly heterogeneous, plus their follow-up and their workup will be very variable depending on when they're seen. So, so my question to you is, how does the model deal with huge heterogeneity and missingness as well in, in this kind of scenario and potentially your, your thoughts on, on its application as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, great question because it's a great application and um, actually uh, we, we just started with the Brompton Hospital uh, with uh, Dr. Anand Chan, um, a project with Pfizer um, for um, fungal diseases. The methodology is behind what you are saying may be the same. So what we do is, um, first of all, when you have gaps in the data, you, we try to find other sources of information to fill the gaps, like uh, implementing some data fusion. And um, when, we, when we have other sources, sources of information, sometimes we don't. In that case, there is also the possibility to implement data-driven models that are able to emulate data, um, like um, create, let's say, in an in a easy way, I can say like creating la realistic data, learning from the real data that you already have. Especially in medical application, this is one of the main issue. You don't have big data most of the time. You just have few, um, data because you don't have so many people, so many patients giving you the possibility to collect the data. So in that case, there are um, data-driven models that we are working on um, based on also on generative adversarial network. Anyway, learning from the real data, how to create realistic data. That then can be, can help you to have a bigger data set that then you can use to train a robust data learning model that can help you to understand, uh, um, to, to make an action depending on your your input, in your case, uh, how the your patient is, uh, is having. Hope, I hope these, uh, these answer your question. Yes, no, thank you and an excellent talk also. Right, thanks. And uh, I think Frederick has a question. Hi there. Hi Rosanna, that was a brilliant talk. Thank you so much. Um, my question was around the physics-based models. And what I was wondering there, you mentioned that the kind of bottleneck there really is that training those models takes a very long time. And I was wondering, is the reason for that that you just have to generate so many different predictions to be able to train your data effectively, or train your model effectively? Or is it just that it's such a non-linear problem that it just takes a very, very long time to minimize your loss function when you're training it? No, the, the main problem in that, in the way we implemented that, is that every time step of the training, the network calls the CFD. This means that you call the CFD, you run the CFD one time step, and then you give the output of the CFD to the network, and then you do another step of the back propagation, and then you call the CFD, and these again and again, and you can imagine calling the CFD all the time, it's quite costly. Other people are implementing approaches with um, 
approximations of the equation of the CFT. NVIDIA, for example, has a tool for physics information learning. You put your equations and the tool does everything. Uh, but in, when you have a complex system, a complex um, dynamical system, and you have a, a stable CFD, you don't want them to have a network with an approximation of the equation. So this is the reason why we try this other approach, but it's expensive. Cool. And just quickly, just to, just to clarify, so when you say expensive, so how long are each of those CFD runs taking when you're doing the training? Are they sort of seconds or... <laughs> no, Worse. Yes, it, it depends on the application. For example, it may okay. be 10 minutes for a uh, easy application like air pollution in one room every time set 10 minutes or one hour or even two hours. Or for example, the one that uh, the, the pipe in the pipe, uh, the simulation of the flow in the pipe, it was 40 hours. So okay. you also very, very have well. to understand if you can do that. <laughs> Yeah. So, so for the physics, for training the physics-based models, it was kind of more like minutes rather than hours, I guess, per per simulation. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you. thank you. Any any additional questions? I don't see any hand up. I have one additional question for you, and that's going to be a more generic question. It's one that I hear heard a lot. You know, especially when I started doing machine learning and deep learning in earth sciences, there was this preconceived idea that geological data is different, that yes, machine learning works in one domain, but when you bring it to geoscience, ooh, careful, it's very different. I mean, I have, I have my opinion about this, but given that you've worked on so many different domains, I'd like to hear from you if you think that there is some structural difference between data in different fields. Not that you know each data means different different things, but structural differences. Or do you think that essentially data is data, and the methods like you explained, your module approaches, can be extended to any uh, fields with very little modifications? So um, I would say first of all that if you say, for example, and to an um, epidemiologist, uh, uh, I've been using. The, to set up the model that you are using now, I've been using an approach that we developed for cryptocurrency. Probably he would feel quite even upset, saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is epidemic, it's not uh, a cryptocurrency market. So I, I learned to be very careful when I say that is data, because uh, um, people working on the applications feel like, no, my mm -hmm. data, my data. <laughs> the other <laughs> data, I don't mind. So <laughs> just, just to be careful, I will not say data is data. But obviously, depending on the application, and this is where our expertise come, is understanding how treat your data as standard data. Yeah. If it's better considering your data uh, as images or as matrices, or the sparse data for graph neural network, for example, depending on the application, then we decide how to even collect the data, or if the data are already collected, how to treat the data in terms of um, a type. Okay. So in your case, I think there are two main points. One is probably uh, you will be interested in image processing. But an image, when you then you give the image to the model, then it's a matrix. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, for example, if you have sparse data from sensors, uh, but yeah, so still in line with the data that we have been using. Um, hope this answer your question. Yes, absolutely. No, no, you, you absolutely did. We're, re we're reaching the end of this meeting, but I see one more hand up. So let's maybe if we can have one quick question from Mailing. Hi, thank you for your very great presentation. I have a question about I, I see your page, you develop a uh, methods that combine reduced auto model data simulation and uh, deep learning. Maybe it's called ROTDA methods. 
And I noticed this method first uh, uh, adopts a data simulation that combines observations with the backgrounds or the uh, solutions from uh, LUMAC models and then use the, uh, the, the, the results from the data simulation to training. So I just wonder, uh, if, if there is no observations, how how do you get forecast in offline uh, process? Yeah, so we learn. Um, this is something I've been showing in one of the slides. I can go back to, to that slide to, to give you a better answer. But uh, essentially, we learn what the what is the misfit between the CFD and the data simulation. So what I mean is, this was the slide. Yes. Yeah. So essentially, this is showing in this um, in this uh, figure. So this is your CFD. This is your observation. You have your data simulation. Then you have a misfit between your CFD and the data simulation. You mm -hmm. keep this misfit, and then again, and then again, and then you use all these misfits. Obviously, in this image, there are just three. Imagine hundred of misfits. And you learn uh, this misfit with that the uh, neural network. So what this neural network is learning is learning that when the CFD is forecasting something close to this value, it must be adjust to this value. So you keep the neural network, and then as you can see here, G is the neural network, M is your model and it may be uh, any model, dynamical system. So you um, combine the neural network you have with your model, and then the final results will be, instead of this, it will go directly, strictly, strictly on what the data simulation is doing. This is the example. I'm not sure yes. if that answers your question, but... Uh, yeah, I understand what you mean in the uh, correction by data simulation. I just wonder, uh, you showed the picture there is a forecast time. So how do you make forecast if there is no observations in off-night tra off process? It's not in uh, online training process. Yeah, because the, the, your forecasting model can predict the future, no? The future time steps can be predicted yeah. with your forecasting model. Yeah, then together with your forecasting model, you also use the neural network that you trained on the historical data, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then instead of making forecasting only with your model, mm -hmm. you couple your model with the neural network. So you make forecasting in the future with mm -hmm. your model, but you adjust your model with this neural network. It's more adjusting the model that you are using to make forecast. OK, OK, thanks. Thank you very much, Rosella. So we'll we'll stop the question here because I think we're over time and people probably want to have lunch and you probably want to have lunch as well. Um, there was one quick question whether the slides would be available on your official data learning website. The answer is yes. So thanks again for a great talk. I think we can all say thank you again to Rosella and uh, thank you everyone for coming. And I'm very excited about the future. Let's see what comes up next, Rosella. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sadie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.